This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Hey everybody, it's John Hall and sitting across from me is Mike Palin from Microphone Brewing in Chicago, uh, but who I don't even think you spend all that much time in Chicago anymore. You're, <laughs> like, Mr. Anymore. You're like Mr. Collaboration when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to beers. So we're going to talk about your brewery. We're going to talk about uh, collaborations and working with fun ingredients. But first, uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that this episode is brought to you by G&D Chillers. And as the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, G&D Chillers has set the standard on quality service and dedication to their customers' craft. For 25 years, G&D has led the way on innovative solutions that match their brewing customers' immediate and future needs. With a wide selection of custom-built chillers, G&D offers the Nano Chiller, the perfect solution for nano breweries, all the way up to their larger capacity units like the Vertical Air Chiller, built for higher volume operations. Contact G&D Chillers today for your chiller sizing needs at 1-800-555-0973 or reach out online at gdchillers.com. And this episode is also brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, host of Homebrew Con, publisher of Zymergy Magazine, and organizer of the National Homebrew Competition. Well, Mike, thanks for sitting down and joining, uh, joining the podcast uh, for the second time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the first time that we actually sat down was at the Weldworks Invitational uh, uh, earlier this summer, and uh, the, the audio just didn't work. And I was so bummed because uh, it was such a fun conversation, and I'm going to try to recapture some of that lightning in a bottle um, uh, today. But we find ourselves in Breckenridge, Colorado, again. So two guys from out of state once again meeting uh, here in Colorado at the Big Beers, Belgians, and Barley Wines Festival, uh, which is happening uh, this uh, second weekend here in January. Um, and you came into town a few days early before this festival, and you've already done 90, 100? How many collaborations have you done so far? <laughs> yeah, this week I've done about 200. Uh, no, <laughs> we, did, uh, we did two. So we did one at uh, Cerebral um, and then another one at Outer Range yesterday. I guess before we, we fully talk about the collaborations, for the folks who don't know Microphone, uh, and I imagine our listeners do because they're plugged into you know, hip breweries of the moment, um, how, how do you describe it to people? So Microphone is a small um, nano brewery based on music. I used to work in the music industry um, and I was homebrewing at the same time. I wanted to combine my two passions of music and beer. And so we created Microphone Brewing. Obviously, my name is Mike. So we played off that. So sure. it's M-I-K-E-R-P-H-O-N-E. Um, and just kind of went off of that. You know, everything has some kind of reference to music, be it a, a song name or album name or a reference to a band or some kind of music terminology. Um, we just have fun with it. And, you know, we started brewing in the early part of 2015. That same year, we got uh, Rape Beer Best for Illinois. And we were on the, the top list of breweries in the country from Beer Advocate. Um, and that kind of just propelled us to the next level. That was through a contract brew se- a series of two years doing contract brewing. Um, and we finally got our own space open at the beginning of 2017. Well, you had a really interesting journey, though, of how you got to your brewery. I mean, like you were working for other brewers, but you had your side project. You had, you know, I mean, like that I think is interesting to so many people because there's so many different paths to getting your own place. And sure. it's not always just, oh, I went to the bank, I got a loan, we bought stainless, uh, you know, here we are. A lot of the time it's, you know, finding ways in. And when you can have collaborative partners uh, that, you know, sort of help you while you're also helping them, uh, I, I find that really interesting. And I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised that that hasn't happened more. I mean, there's some folks who just don't want it, want that model as part of their business. But then I think there's other folks in this, collaborative industry that that are that are really into it yeah so if we rewind back to 2010 that's when my wife and i got our house and uh, we were very lucky that the basement had like pitched floors <laughs> hot water cold water splitter a cellar so we converted that into a, ba- a basement brewery and started going at it and with my marketing background i knew i had to put a name to it and so that's when we started microphone um, out of the basement and then during that time is when small breweries were starting to pop up in chicago so pipeworks was the, the first one that mm-hmm. caught my attention and you now on their facebook they're like hey does anyone want to come down to the brewery and help us today so I did, and that was when they were moving their first fermenters in. And from that day forth, they were always like, come by and help us brew or help us package. Um, and during that time, that's where I met Drew Fox from 18th Street. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of helping him with his Kickstarter campaign. 
um, and helping him brew some beers. And that was an Indiana to, brewery? Uh, yeah, he's just over in Gary, Indiana. Yeah. Um, and the, the thought was, all right, let's, you know, he tried a bunch of my home brews and absolutely loved it, loved the marketing behind it. He was going to extend an opportunity to do an old prop at his place. So it would be 18th Street and microphone within the Gary Walls. Um, but then he had an interesting opportunity to be the head brewer at a new startup brew pub in Chicago. Um, but he was already too far down the road with 18th street. So he offered that opportunity to me and I took that job. Um, unfortunately that just never got off the ground. And so that was at a time where, um, it was very stressful for me and my wife and we had a, a young daughter at the time and we decided, you know what, let's just finally invest in ourselves and start microphone as a pro brewery. Yeah. Um, and that's, that was right at 2015 and we, just hit the ground running and and you sort of hit that wave right i mean 2015 was one of those years where i think when we look back 10 years from now or 20 years from now that 2015 is kind of going to be one of those seminal years i think 2012 was uh 2011 2012 but 2015 struck me as there's a lot of your generation of brewers that fully embraced the smaller model um uh, generally just sort of celebrated fuckery in general uh you know with beer um and all sort of like you all kind of like came up at the same time and uh i don't know there, there, there's sort of a camaraderie that i don't think we saw in the industry for a good period of time like you saw it in the early days with everybody kind of getting together and then it sort of everybody went into their own little holes yep. uh for a bit and now it seems like there's i don't know with, with your group of brewers that sort of camaraderie that happened yeah i think it was kind of just a, a product of you know this one brewery pipeworks for us kind of incubated a home and a safe place for us to kind of learn and help each other and then split off from there. So, you know, out of there came Spiteful, out of there came 18th Street. Um, we, I came out of there. Um, Slapshot was doing some stuff there. So it's we, we learned a lot out of that one place and we all kind of had each other's backs. Um, and still holds true back in Chicago. We've got a little thing called the Itty Bitty Brewers Group that if, hey, I need a bag of Simcoe hops and immediately someone's like, oh, I got those, I got you taken care of. Or like, I have a question or I have my chillers broken down. Um, we're, we're still there to help each other even though it's gotten incredibly congested. I think when I first started, we were like pushing to that 4,000 brewery rate number. Yeah. Um, and now we're talking over 7,000 yeah. in, in a short time. Yeah. And so you're starting to see that crunch back home. Um, but we're all still there to help each other out because we are small businesses. A lot of us are privately owned. This is, you know, our family's money is that we pooled together to kind of get this thing off the ground. And we yeah. take a lot of pride and respect in that. And we look at the other breweries who do the same and we want them to see them be successful. And you know, if they ever need anything, we're here for them. So I, I, I find that interesting though, just because it is such a business at, at the same time. Like you have to worry, you know, you, like you want to be good to your friends and you want to be good to, to other folks in the industry, but then you also have to worry about your own bottom line and paying your employees and making sure that, you know, your beer gets out there. And as much as, you know, I, and, and this is where I find it really interesting is there's so many, you know, brewers who sort of talk the game of collaboration, but then, you know, there's somebody in the back room who is uh, trying to find ways of screwing other brewers, you know, at a business. Um, but it, it strikes me, at least in the, 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 the folks that I've seen you around with, that um, you can all sort of coexist in the same world because you're all doing just different enough from each other um, or, you know, have your own fan bases uh, that, you know, you don't necessarily have to worry about, you know, feeding your employees or, you know, keeping your, 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 your lights on, um, while also trying to make sure that, you know, the guy down the street, uh, doesn't do better than you. hundred percent. I mean, I think I can't speak for everybody for us. We've always trying to find that, that balance of let's have a good work environment, but also yeah. a good, um, fun life on the outside of it. And you know, we're only making a little over a thousand barrels a year, so we're not pumping too hard. Um, but we found that that number gets us to a place where we can save some money and invest in expansion. We can take care of all of our employees. We can give them benefits, um, and, you know, continue to make the quality product we do. And we spare no sacrifices when we come to ingredients. You know, we're sometimes spending close to $20,000 on a uh, vanilla just for one batch of beer. Um, but those are the things. Because you're buying the real thing. Yeah, real and thing. Then, like, the prices are just astronomical these days. Yeah, it's days. just gone through. If I wish I would have bought a, a vanilla plantation at some point. but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you and everybody else who's exactly. now this crunch. But, I mean, I think, you know, when we started the microphone space in Elk Grove, there was nothing around us. We were on a complete desert island out there. And now we've got breweries like Unane that's about 15 minutes away, more brewing 15 minutes away. Sure. And we've all kind of like seen a rise of that. You know, these consumers who come out, it's a suburb destination. They want to bounce around. If they're going to take the time to come out from the city or come in from Wisconsin or Indiana or Michigan, they want to hit up a few locations. So it's kind of really helped us to have this suburban corridor out there. Um, 
and you know people bounce around and i don't see those guys as competition i just see them as kind of like the spillover effect you know we're, we're all here together close enough but not not too close right they're not next door next door but um, i wouldn't mind another brewery not grove to be honest with you i think it'd be fun for all of us to have that kind of close camaraderie and we could help each other out and you know if you're ever in a pinch and hey neighbor you got any sugar it, it's there for you yeah um, but like i said it's we're not making enough where we're you know having to really oh my gosh we have 30,000 barrels to move what are we going to do a thousand barrels is completely manageable and you know we sell 95 percent of our product in-house right now um, which really? is which is great we, we barely go out to distribution and if we do we go to maybe 10 stores at a time are you doing self-distribution yep self-distribution um and we'll stick to that. I mean, it's just, it's fun for us to, you know, have that interface with our stores who've helped us since day one. And that's, that's kind of where the model has changed a lot, right? Like that crowd of breweries who's, you know, the pipe works and um, Spifles and 18th Streets and microphones at the beginning, we were humping as hard as we could to make beer, packaging it, loading it up in a van and getting it to every store we possibly could. So strictly brew, package, distro. Yeah. Now that model, you know, in early 14 or into 15 was you need to have a tasting room. You need to have that destination where people can come drink at the source. And now I'm starting to see back home that because we have so many breweries, you know, Chicago just got named number one with like 167 breweries in the Chicagoland area. Um, people have great beer within five minutes of them, 10 minutes of them. So now you have to not only have your on-site location for those people who want to come out and experience the brand, but you also need to go out back to distro and get beer into that market. Otherwise, you know, they don't need to buy it. They'll yeah. go and buy the other beer. Um, so our plan for this 2019 is that we're finishing up our expansion right now. Um, and that the main point of the expansion is getting that can line up and running. Sure. Because the, the shift from bottles to cans is pretty fast. Yeah. Um, and a lot Did of that you was, ever bottle? Uh, we all we still bottle. Okay. So we've got a 750 milliliter line and a 12 ounce line. Okay. Um, and everything, you know, back in the day, case, everything yeah. was bombers and 750s. Right. And now, like these I mean, days, I mean, it's nothing. You it's can't. the death of it. It yeah, is. Yeah, we've been talking about that at the magazine. It's just, you know, is this package not long? For and this it was a paradigm and, shift. I remember back in the day when beer and can was seen as swill, and yeah. now it's completely turned on its head. And if you aren't in cans, it's cans are get the hell out of here. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we've already invested in our cane line. We got a cane line out of Colorado, Twin Monkeys. Um, we've had it in our building for almost six months now. We're just waiting to finish out the expansion <laughs> yeah. and get into cans. So uh, I feel like every day I have to answer like, why are you not in cans? Why are you not in cans? And it's just a product of our space. Uh, but we should be up and running this, this canning machine hopefully by March. Um, and that'll be a huge change for us. So I, I, I'm curious though about the large format bottles. Are, are you, Will you keep them for certain beers? Hundred percent. Okay. Yeah, like a lot of our I, sour I think stuff. They still should be an occasion bottle. Like yeah. it's it's cans just doesn't play for everything. And Stout, like, like our stouts are our big adjunct stouts. Yeah. And our um, sours will stay in the seven fifties for sure. Okay. Um, a lot of that comes down to also price. I mean, there is no and we 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 decided to go this year of putting our barrel aged beers into four pack, twelve ounce bottles. Okay. Um, and the price point, you know, it was sticker shock for some people. 50, 60 bucks for a four pack. And I, you know, I had faced right away. You see that and you go, holy cow, that's expensive. Yeah. But if you do the per ounce, you're like, oh, actually it's cheaper than buying a two bombers. Yeah. Uh, but that sticker shock is where it's hard. So if we were to put, you know, Imperial smells like being spirit in a four pack, it's going to be pushing that 40, 45 bucks. Jesus. Um, but if we put it, keep it in the 750, you know, we can get that out to them at 15 bucks a bottle and not, yeah. not, you know, ruffle any feathers. So certain beers like that have to stick in. <laughs> Yeah, into that seven. It just makes sense. Yeah, yep. I mean, I I can't I can't even imagine some of the internet comments that you'd get for something like that. Yeah, and but honestly, like I'm a firm believer that the beer is better in bottle. <laughs> um, Are you? Know, you? I, with the machine that we have, you know, do is pretty low. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got way smaller opening on top, less you know, we're capping on foam. Yeah, less chance of do on that. Um, you know, our canine is supposed to have a low do, but you never know. Those you know, it's got way more. You're gonna have to spend some time dialing in exactly. Yeah. Um, and I just think that, you know, the glass is stronger and glass can hold up longer. Um, but we'll see, but yeah, I mean, everything is just completely flipped and went to cans. So all of our hoppy beers will go in cans, but we're going to start doing, we'll put regular bean spirit in a can, which is like a, you know, 7% style. We'll put that mm -hmm. in a can. Um, we'll start doing some, you know, pilsners and lagers in cans, but, um, we're just excited to finally get back into that capture moment where everyone else is in cans. We're like the last ones to, to get to cans. But um, a lot of that was also just a product of me and my employees. I wanted to stick to us owning our own equipment mm -hmm. and having my employees or me part of that too, package our own our goods. So, you know, mobile canning became a huge thing back in Illinois. Um, and that's where you saw a lot of these smaller breweries coming out of cans pretty quickly. Uh, but we wanted to, like I said, 
own our own stuff and own our own product and own up to our own packaging. So that's where we're a little behind, but we'll be there soon in the next few months. Cool. Um, just going to take a quick break right here. And great beers are made from select ingredients. With BSG, you'll bring the world to your brew house with an unparalleled and diverse selection of ingredients from across the globe to just down the road. Their dedicated customer service team and industry experience provides you with the assistance you need every step of the way. Let BSG be your supplier of choice for products essential to making great artisanal beverages so you can stay focused on your craft. For more information, visit us, and them, I guess, at bsgcraftbrewing.com or contact them at 1-800-374-2739. Mike, you're sitting back down. Thanks so much. No problem. Uh, we're drinking Hellas from... Beerstadt Lager House in Denver, which I think for every brewer and beer fan who comes into town now, uh, it is like the stop. Like, it was you have slammed to. during GBF. I mean, oh, yeah. everybody wanted to be there. Everybody wanted to be drinking that slow pour pills. It's so good. Um, it is and I so love their banh mi sandwich, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. So it's the like, salmon? Yeah. Oh, money. It's great. Yeah, it's so. a great sandwich. I had it, I had it uh, for lunch. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the – relationship of music and beer because it's it's one of these things that you know you sometimes hear about like collaborations like stone just announced that they're doing something with metallica and everybody's like oh okay great like you know and there's been brewers that have done beers with musicians um you know dogfish head a couple years ago did bitches brew uh inspired by miles davis and you know there's there's like a you know some some there's been some cool things but a lot of the time there's been I don't know if it's necessarily just like marketing or if it's just sort of, uh, hey, this is something easy that people understand and beer is maybe not something that people understand. Um, And so merging the two together. But where do you see the relationship of what music brings to beer and I guess vice versa? I mean, for me, it's always just been a natural product. You know, once I started making beer and being in the music industry, those two are hand in hand. Every time you go to a concert, it was always have a beer and enjoy the, the show. Um, but as we got deeper into it, you know, this was kind of us showcasing our, sh- our soundtrack to life. You know, mm-hmm. the songs that influence us, the bands that have influenced us. You'll see a lot of, you know, alternative 90s um, references or nowadays a lot of EDM, a lot of hip hop references. Um, it just so- kind of showcases what we listen to and what kind of music styles and genres have influenced us in the past. And honestly, I can't live without music. It's like actually on my arm I have where words fail, music speaks. Um, music speaks to me every minute of the day. And even when I'm sleeping, I'm listening to music in my head. It's just what, it's my, my heartbeat. It's what keeps me going. Um, and I'm open to all genres. You gotta, I think you got to understand it and appreciate yeah. it. Um, and I, you know, I loved working in the music industry. I did a lot of music marketing, music promotions. Um, it was just fun to see how consumers are attracted to music. Um, and it's, it's a big influencer and it's a big part, people part of his life. And so is beer. Um, beer has become way less taboo than it used to be in the back in the day. You know, if you were a beer drinker, you were kind of seen as an alcoholic and a lot of it was closeted. Now it's beer is everywhere, right? You've got it. We're here at a, a ski resort. And yeah. It's, it's everywhere. A family ski resort. A family no ski less, resort. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and and a, look at all of our tasting rooms nowadays. They're family friendly. I mean, well, some of them are. Let's, let's not even open. <laughs> I don't need the Twitter. Well, microphone Twitter, is, microphone yeah. is family friendly. And yeah. I think my kids have been to more breweries than they have restaurants. Yeah. Just cause that's kind of, you know, what us 30 somethings and 40 somethings yeah. do. Um, but for me, no, my kid loves going to the brewery. It's you know 21 months and she's, you know, she loves like banging on stainless when, uh, when the brewers are cool and whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, shiny things. Yep. But, uh, you know, we recently just did a, uh, collaboration beer with Andrew Grumman from Andrew Grumman in the wilderness, um, something corporate Jack's mannequin. And it was all kind of derived from, he has a charity mm-hmm. for cancer. Um, so every bottle sold, we donated a dollar toward his charity. Um, that was fun. You know, we kind of sat down and, you know, he's, he was honest. He's like, I don't drink a lot of beer. Um, but what I do drink is I like to drink an old fashioned. So we took that idea and created an old fashioned Berliner. How'd um, you do it? It was our Berliner base. We added a little bit more amber malt to kind of get that amber color f- mm-hmm. that, uh, um, old fashioned would have. So then you wanted used, the look too, not just yeah. the flavor. Oh, Interesting. Yeah. And then uh, maraschino cherries, oak spirals like yeah. to emphasize kind of that, you know, the wood yeah. part of it. Um, and then orange peel. Okay. And so it, ca- it came out great. He was super happy about it. We went to the show in Chicago and it was a, a big charity event show and he, he, you know, he hyped up the collaboration and we got to hang out and, you know, we signed a blown up album art that we're going to hang out in the brewery. Um, 
But I think, you know, as we continue to get bigger and bigger, um, I'd, I'd love to bring on more artists as they come in town. We're five minutes away from Allstate Arena in Chicago. Um, I'd love to have some of those artists come in while they're in. And if they want to just have a beer or if they want to get involved and do something from the from ground up. Yeah. Because um, I know I know these guys are drinking beer. Um, and you see not just even music. You've got athletes. you got me. Um, I know, like Chris Bosch. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I had actually just given some beer to um, Eminem's manager, Paul Rosenberg. Um, and we can get, well, I'll side by that for a second. Come okay. back to it. But I was like, Hey, did you get that box of beer? He's like, yeah, I totally know I did because I gave Chris Bosch some. I'm like, okay, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, he's a home brewer. He's into beer. Um, it's, it kind of just spans across everybody, race, age, whatever. It's people drink beer and they look to craft beer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with the M&M thing, I had made a beer called Slim Hazy. And then I got an email from Paul Rosenberg. And, yeah. and that's what I thought. The cease and desist was coming. I'm like, oh, okay. It was like a five o'clock on a Thursday. <laughs> I was just about to leave for the day. <laughs> get the email and I'm like, and I know Paul Rosenberg's name. Like that's, he's, he's everything yeah. I wanted to be in the industry from a to management and all that good stuff. And I was like, Oh God, I'm in trouble. And now it was the opposite. It was, Hey, I saw you did a beer called some hazy. That's super, super cool. I love craft beer. And he went back into how like his wife's from near Oak Grove village and this and that. And he's like, you know, if you could send me some, would you? And I'm like, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. I don't know why I have an email from you in my <laughs> inbox, but this is amazing. Yes. So um, yeah, and the, I know the he, cost of shipping beer is a lot less than attorney fees. A hundred percent. So yeah. And you know, we got, I actually got to sit down with him in New York and talk, um, just music industry. And he was very intrigued about the, the brewing industry and he didn't understand the whole collaboration aspect of it. And I had just been in New York collaborating with Finback. Um, so we, you know, he's super intrigued and he was like, well, maybe one of these days we can do a, you know, Def Jam collaboration with microphone. And I'm like, done whenever you want to come out and do it, let's do it. So That's yeah, awesome. I think this, the, the two things play together and I, you know, Beer drinkers are listening to music and musicians are drinking beer. So, so we're recording this, uh, 11 days into the new year. Uh, happy birthday to your mom, by the way. Um, <laughs> and to you as well. Oh, thanks so much. And, um, I, I, I'm, I'm curious. So looking back at 2018, how many collaborations did you do? Ooh, you know, I was going through this on the plane the other day and I, <laughs> I think I was close to, I don't want to lie, but I think it was like 35. Okay. Somewhere around there. That's yeah. a lot. It That's is. A lot. Yeah, it is. I mean, during Fobab, which is the festival of barrel-aged beer in Chicago, mm-hmm. um, all these brewers had come in town, and they're like, "Hey, can we collab?" And so I think that was that was but intense. You just have people like stacked up one one by yeah, one. It's like, well, it was we like, can fit you in on Thursday at four a.m. Six, but you have six to be collabs done. like yeah. within that time frame. So Holy crow! It was nuts. Yeah, but um, but you're also traveling to do collabs. Yeah, as well. a lot of it. You know, a lot of it stems from the festivals that we've been invited to now, and yeah. um, to, to make it worth its time, um, we also you know try to find people that we've linked up with before and. Um, like-minded brewers. Um, we're not just going to do a collab to do a collab. It's got to make sense. And it's got to be um, something that's genuine and something that isn't the first conversation piece. It's like, hey, you want a brewery? We should collab someday. It should be like, case in point is with Lee at Outer Range. I had gone okay. out to Outer Range because Sean from Cerebral had recommended it. Um, went there, loved the beer, sent Sean a note and said, thanks for the recommendation. This beer locks, blocks of light is amazing. He sent that text to Lee and Lee's like, hey, sorry, I missed him. If he's still around, have him come back the next day. I did. We talked for an hour and a half. We realized we both own our own businesses. We both start off. We have uh, daughters. Um, all this stuff kind of just rolled into. We have so much in common. And then afterwards, like, hey, next time you come back, let's brew. And I'm like, yeah, likewise, come up by me. So those are where that's, it makes sense. And, you know, we do go to these fests. It, it, it's a fest every weekend nowadays. It's nuts. But we you, pick and choose those battles. Again, this is when, when I wish we had video because you sort of closed your eyes just, just for half a second, but in that sort of exhausted you know, because it is exhausting. I mean, this is yeah. it, it, the fest. Uh, the fest life sounds like a lot of fun, but it is. It's it's tiring. It is, and ways. it's it's hard to balance it because you know we're still a small company, so I have yeah. to make sure that the guys back home sure. are doing what they're doing to keep the business moving forward. I've got a family at home, so I've got to you know sure check in and make sure they're not they're not thinking I'm abandoning them. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we're we're ping ponging back and forth across the U.S. nonstop, and you know, with the the turn of the calendar, it's you got a lot of festivals up in the front of the year. So we're here in Colorado. I'm in California in two weeks, then I'm in Miami, then back to California, then to Nashville, then to New York and Copenhagen and all this stuff. So it's just, it's, it's exhausting, but it's also a lot of fun because you get introduced to new markets, you get introduced to new breweries that you may never, you know, brush shoulders with before. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's been a fun way for us to kind of expand our, you know, we're a small, small brewery located just outside of Chicago. People may have never heard of us, but if we go to a fest in say San Diego, you know, that's opens up to us and people fly in all the time because we're right next to O'Hare Airport. So we get those people coming in like, hey, I heard so-and-so, or I saw you at this fest, I'll come check you out next time. 
And so that helps. It really yeah. does. Um, it's, it's worth the time. It's worth the energy to come off these fests and do it. And I love that. And I mean, when I first quit the music industry, you know, I was traveling a lot for that, going to South by Southwest and doing a lot of trips to New York and Nashville. And I thought with the brewery, I'm never going to leave the cage. I'll be stuck in the back making beer every day long. I'm traveling more than I could have ever imagined. Huh. Um, Racking up those uh, delta points. Yeah, right. And it's it's uh it's been fun. And you know, last year into this year, we've got invited to some of you know these bucket list fests that I have on my list. You know, McKellar's MBCC in Copenhagen. We finally got our own invite. Okay. Even this one, you know, Big Beers this is my first year ever doing Big Beers here yeah. in Breck. Um, so we're super excited to be a part of that. All right. So what you, I, I want to talk about the actual specific beers that you're making, though, because they are. You use the word genuine when you're doing this, and 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 I I want you to unpack that a little bit as to, you know, what that means for you because a lot of the time when I see these collabs that are happening and some of the stuff that you're doing, it's sort of just like I mentioned earlier, like general fuckery of, you know, hey, we're gonna, you know, we got this weird ingredient, or you know, like let's, you know, screw around and boundary push and 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 that kind of thing, and I guess that speaks to you guys being genuine in that whole thing. But I mean, what, what's a beer I, I, like, like walk me through like one beer from start to finish that you think sort of exemplifies what you want to get out of these collaboration experiences. So I think, I mean, I'll just go back to the outer range one. Um, that we did a, uh, yesterday. We did our third collab together at out here in Frisco mm-hmm. and he's done one out by me. Um, the second time we collabed out here, we made a stout Okay. Lee has never made a stout in his entire life, not even homebrewing. And so he kind of was like, I know. And so when he was out by me, he was drinking all of our stouts and he's like, I'm, I'm in love. And like, I would, I think I'm ready to finally make a stout. Will you be there? Will you guide me and help me? And I was like, done, you know, for sure. So we made that stout. Feels like (laughs) the first time. You're my (laughs) only hope. Yeah. Yeah. But that's to me, like, that's what I like about doing collabs is that we sit down from, from the start, we write the recipes together um, if it's a brewery coming into microphone to brew, I want them to put their thumbprint on it. People know what microphone thumbprint is back home, but if you're coming in and people's never been ever heard of you, I want you kind of put your spin on it. Maybe you dry hop differently than we do. Maybe you use a different kind of grain. Um, so I, I like to have that influence kind of showcased when they come mm-hmm. into microphone. But if I'm going on the road, if they let me, I'd like to showcase you know, some ingredients that we use or stuff that we find that is helpful and reliable. Um, so then that way the two different markets are seeing oh, wow, interesting. I can see the difference in this beer. Um, and I think that's where the genuineness comes to it. It's We're not just throwing darts at a board and say, hey, I got this bag of grain and these ingredients, let's but, just make a beer. What, but that's what some of these often feel like. Yeah, we've never gone that route. And that's just, um, I, I don't find a point in that. I think I, I really, I think we should both parties and the consumer should get something out of these collaborations, whether it be pushing the boundaries, you know, introducing a stout to a person who's a brewery stout or using some, ingredients that we think could be really fun to make something happen with a beer. Like when we did the beer at Weldworks with, um, you know, cereal, it was, it was kind of, what are we doing? What kind of cereal do you use? Uh, Cocoa Puffs. Yeah. Um, it was fun. It turned out great. Um, but you know, that one was kind of that kind of fucker idea, but we're like, Hey, let's try this. And you know, we both have played with cereal before. Let's try this together and see what happens out of it. Um, I don't know. And I, I, I find a lot of, um, trust in these brewers when they say, Hey, come brew with me. You know, that, that, sh- that shows that they understand what we're doing. They want to let us come into their house and brew with them. Um, and then, you know, that beer is going to be on tap or going out to dish show with their name on it. And well, so it still has to have like their brand to live up to, you know? And so that, just, and that's sort of the thing. Have you run into any where they just didn't work and you had to dump? Um, as far as collabs, no. Okay. Every collab has been fine. Okay. Um, We've, we've had a, dump. a piece of wood to knock. Yeah. yeah, we've had to dump two beers out of microphone like right off the bat because our system just failed us. Okay, um, we're not afraid to dump beer either. Right, uh, but no, none of the collabs. I think, I mean, we like I said, we we rely on what ingredients we know work as the base, um, and then if there's something that's kind of weird and funky, we kind of try to do our best to research it. Um, and if we know another brewery has used something before, we'll ask them, hey, we're planning on doing this. Would you mind letting us know how much you use per pound or what would your recommendations? And that's where we can rely on this network of brewers that we have. So we recently just did a beer with oysters in it. Um, and I've never brewed a beer with oysters, you know, homebrew or pro level. Um, the brewery that we were collabing with, they had um, a friend who did it. And he was like, here's what we used. Here's what we we're going for. What are you guys going for? But like, well, we don't want so much of the earthiness. We want more of the saltiness. And like, 
here's your perfect range. And we, we went with it. And so yeah. that stuff works. And it's, it's not just like, again, we're not just throwing darts at a board and seeing what works, what doesn't work. It's got a lot of thought process to it. And, um, some of these things take months to come into fruition too. That one with the oysters, like we had talked about it for six months. Um, and then finally, like it just came, came the right time to do it. But in that time we talked about it, we built the recipe, we came up with a cool name for it. Um, really had a specific goal with what the beer was going to be. Um, and you know, executed on it. What's a brewery that you haven't collaborated with that you would like to? <laughs> I was just having this conversation a few days ago. Um, for me, I think you know a lot of people compare us to Monkish. Um, and I, I just recently actually got to meet Henry. Um, he, they do a lot of hip hop references. They do a lot of hazy beers now. Um, I think it would just you know the, the two brands kind of would link up and I think we would come up with a really cool beer name off of hip hop reference. Um, do some kind of fun hazy IPA. Um, yeah, so that was like the first one that would come to my mind. I mean, honestly the breweries I brew with have knocked off my whole bucket list. It's, it's been crazy that we've gotten to be able to do that. Um, there's a few coming up in the next few months that, you know, we're, we're going to fill up that, that list. Like we're brewing with McKellar in San Diego. Um, and it's just, those to me are like, I, it, 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 it floors me that I get to brew with these people. Um, have you come across an ingredient and said, wait, I want to do something with this ingredient with this particular brewery? Like, has it, has it gone backwards that way? No, it hasn't. It really okay. hasn't. Um, it, it, it hasn't. I mean, there were times that I know certain breweries have, you know, a good thumb or a good stronghold on barrel aging, right? So when we wanted to do a beer at, at Weldworks, we're like, you know, I trust their, their barrel aging program. So that's what we need the blend of rum barrels and whiskey barrels and sweet disposition came out of that and it turned out amazing. Um, so it was like one of those things where I know I wouldn't recommend, hey, let's put that in barrels if I, this brewery had never done a barrel aged beer before. Um, so that kind of works in that way, but as far as like a specific ingredient and be like, Hey, we should use this together. Haven't yeah, done that. Um, there were some times though, when, you know, I would sit back and be like, I wonder if there's a way that we could make this kind of a Chicago themed beer and people would use an ingredient that would have like some Chicago roots to it, but everything leads back to a hot dog and there's nothing really in a hot dog <laughs> that I think we can make beer with. So, <laughs> well, I mean, Chicago dogs though. I mean, you got the relish. Yeah. You got the peppers and you got the, just no ketchup. Do not put ketchup. No, that's, that's, that's a cardinal <laughs> sin out there, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, take your Heinz and get the hell out of here. Exactly. Um, one of the things that, that we've talked about previously that I, that I'm really, I, I really like your take on all of this is how you incorporate health into beer. And, you know, you, you talked a little bit about the balance early on of, you know, making sure that what's happening back at the brewery uh, is managed okay when you're on the road and certainly when you're there. And then also, you know, having a young family and, you know, making sure that you're there for that. I, I, I think, you know, there's a lot, and then it's personal health as well, which, which I know is, is, is important to you. Um, and it's something that is being talked about more and more and more these days. And I think is, is, is great that it's coming to the forefront because when you do run a small business, from what I've been told, uh, it is, you know, it, it's all consuming and, you know, when you, when you talk to folks like afterwards, uh, you know, 20 years in, it's like, well, what would you have done different? And it's, I wish I had more time with my family or I wish I had, you know, X, Y, or Z. And it's always these balanced things. And I think that that's sort of the, the, it, it is, a, it's, it's, it's a tightrope walk, right. For doing all of that. And yep. I mean, from at least by appearances, you seem to be doing it fairly well. I mean, like, I don't go to your house and actually check up on you, but, uh, but you know, but this is something that it seems you've spent a lot of time being mindful of and then putting into practice. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, there's no lie that when I first started this industry, I was weighing 180 pounds and you know, here now I'm sitting at 215, right? We drink beer a lot. We eat garbage yes, we on did. the road. And yeah. a lot of it came from just these long days. I mean, we were a small, small team of two of us, you know, and we're, we're cranking out 14, 16 hours a day and you come back and do it again the next day. Um, so there wasn't time to kind of take a break and, and work out and stuff like that. And, as we've kind of gotten into this groove now that we, you know, we, we typically work nine to five. We're not going beyond that much. Um, there's some days that we have just a, a half day. Mm -hmm. Um, but those days for me, I'm trying to get out and be more active. And obviously with my kids being six and almost three, you know, they keep me active as well. Um, and just always kind of being mindful of that. And I think one of the things that we started looking at and you see the posts about it, like diabetes, diabetes beers all the time. Um, with these big, sweet and yeah. stouts yeah. is that we started looking at calories and be like, whoa, we're really putting a lot of calories in here. Um, and so for us, um, consuming during the day is 
has gone way down. We got to be conscious of it. And, you know, with drinking leads to bad eating and all those decisions, it's just a bad snowball. Effect. And then you have, you yeah, know, those French fries sleep, always seem like a really good idea after, you know, the fourth pint. Yeah. yeah poor sleep and all that stuff. So yeah. for me, this last year was a lot about um, biking and, you know, and we've actually linked up with a, several guys in Chicago brewers as well that have gotten the same mindset and started working out more and biking more. Um, and it's been fun. It's before we did before Fobab, we jumped on our bikes and cruised around Chicago. Um, when we were out here for uh, GBF, we did like a 60 mile ride out to Jesus, golden and yeah. back in. Um, so we're trying to, trying to really get that incorporated in our lives. Unfortunately, I just tore my ACL, MCL and damaged my meniscus. So I am uh, can only do a three-quarter revolution on the bike right now, but uh, I'm hoping these next six months I can get back on my feet and you know get back to working out. You're wa- you're walking pretty well, though. Um, yeah, for only three weeks after surgery. It's amazing what modern medicine can do nowadays. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think right now we're at 7,100 breweries. There's another 1,000 or so that the Brewers Association says uh, is in planning. planning. Yep. Uh, and a lot of these will be small places like yours, you know, thousand barrel. I mean, it's, uh, we had Dave Engers from founders on the podcast, uh, a couple, couple months ago. And he, uh, I think somewhat accurately said that they're probably going to founders will probably be the last million barrel brewery sure. in the U S you know? So these delusions of grandeur that people have of like, Oh man, I'm going to be a, you know, regional 30,000 barrel player. Yeah. You're shaking your head. Uh-huh. I, it, it's just, it, it's I also don't think there's that path of growing your business fast and selling it. I don't think that exists anymore either. Sure. But for anybody who might be starting something, like what, where do you tell them? Like, what have you learned that you think is? I think we actually asked, talked about this in the last one. Yeah. And my, my answer was, I don't know how it would start because this is such a competitive game nowadays. And you have to be able to make some of the best beer out there time after time after time. Sure, we take risks, but we, we hopefully they're calculated. Um, some of the beers we do are seen as gimmicky, but they're fun for us, right? To keep us you know it's finding influence from what stuff we eat or when we go and travel and yeah. get ideas from that and those are things that kind of help us distinguish microphone who they are we're not just making a a blonde porter we're making some crazy weird beers but it's who we are and it's a lot of thought process to deconstruct let's say um a, a cheesecake and try to figure out a way to make that into a beer and have all those flavors emulated with real products how'd you do that um, so it's it's a ton of a ton of ingredients but it's blueberries lemons Graham cracker and cinnamon for the crust. Yeah. Then we had lactose and vanilla. Um, and so all the kind of melds together to make this cheesecake. But you're not getting the tang out of that, though. Like, Lemon. Yeah. And then there's uh, there's cheese. There's like this cheesecake, um, like jello pudding type thing that we can use. So, yeah, it's it all comes together. We just brewed that um, shortly before I came out here. Um, but it what's, tasted great. What's the, the base style amazing. of beer for that? Uh, we did an IPA. Okay. So a, a milkshake. <laughs> a a milkshake. Yeah. IPA. Yeah, milkshake. Great. So, I mean, obviously with the milkshake, vanilla and lactose are already in that. Yeah. That's a key ingredient to pies and cakes and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, going back to it, I think w- w- where I had the benefit was that I could incubate the brand for five years before we actually went pro. I had glassware and T-shirts and a blog as a home brewer. Yeah. I was able to utilize Facebook and on the outside, people thought it was a real brewery, but it was just a homebrew basement shop. Um, people were wearing our T-shirts since day one and going to fests, and I get snaps of people at Dark Lord Day wearing microphone shirts and being proud about it, excited about it. Yeah, um, Having the ability to kind of shadow at Spiteful and 18th Street and Pipeworks and Pig Mines and all those guys. And, you know, that first year when I was getting that uh, brew pub going, I was able to be, you know, brewers would bring me in, let me work for them as their assistant brewer for a week at a time or sometimes months at a time. Um, and really kind of get my feet wet and kind of understand not just what it is to make beer. We can all make beer. That's sometimes the actually easiest part of it all. It's how do we plan our schedule? How do we market this product? How do we run a business? How do we engage our consumers? How do we make sure we're doing the right things? And how are we managing our money? Yeah. Um, and when you're starting off, you're blowing through money so fast. Every day was just a bleeding of money. Um, you know, and thankfully the contract brewing allowed me to kind of get the brand out there, bring in a little bit of revenue. Um, but once we were building that place out, it was just every day, money, 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 money. And I think we were down to like our, literally our last dollar the day before we opened up. We were having wow. to use tri clams from tanks that weren't full yet to, you know, <laughs> just to get by. Um, but and so that's gets, the stuff that just doesn't get talked about enough. No, I mean, <laughs> cause it's not sexy. It's not, it's fun. not, it's not yeah. you know, it's not the, you know, slamming pints down and, you know, bros cheering each other. Kind yeah, of no thing. one wants like to see that we have to have the the guys come and rotted a diaper out of the drain. Yeah. And we had to close the tasting room because of that. Like that's not fun for anybody. Right. 
But that stuff so happens. So right now, beer Twitter is being like, well, that's why you shouldn't have kids at your brewery. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, trust me, I'll sacrifice that. But no, like, you know, the, the heat went out the other day. And those things are, you know, we've got... And that's a huge check when you have yeah. to write it. You know, you think about home repair, you know, that's a couple hundred bucks, but right, right off the bat for, you know, something your size, I yeah. imagine it's... Chillers, you know, those things get... Especially in the Midwest, we go from extreme cold to extreme hot, and these chillers are just getting worked hard. So those things are constantly getting, you know, blowing motors or popping fuses and stuff like that. So, but I think, I think if someone, and actually I've been, I've been working with someone who's trying to get a brewery open in Kansas city. Um, and I was like, if you've got time right now, just take the time. Yeah. You know, start seeding your brand out there, start building a story up, attend events, get your name out there, come into it. And then a year and a half from now or two years from now, have a solid plan ready to go. And then by then you already have a, a core base of followers who are excited for it. But, but if you just come out as another brewery, just another brewery. Sure. But in that though, I, I, I mean, we, we can't ignore quality, right? Because if you have all this hype coming into it uh, and you create a, even just a meh beer, like it, 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 I think it, it, in some ways it, it might, it's, it's even harder. That's why we dump batches one sure. and two. We yeah. had to because we can't come out of the gate with bad beer. So no, you have to, <laughs> you have to thing, establish. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like that, the year and a half or two years before, dial in your recipes. You know, kind of figure out what End is processes and know. Yeah, how what it is works your what is your works, niche? Yeah. What is your style you're going for? Um, and have those things rock solid. So for when you do brew those first batches and release those first batches, you know they're going to be good and, and home runs. But if you're just going to be taking a shot in the dark and hoping for the best, it's not going to work out because there is so much competition. If your first beers are meh or bad. They're going to go out of the guy 10, 10 minutes down the road and not ever come back to you. And, and that's the thing. Like I, I enjoy going to breweries on opening weekends. Like I love the energy. I love the excitement behind it. You know, I love seeing the smiles on the, on the owner's faces and the brewer's faces and everything else like that. And then when I get a beer that is just like not even close to be ready for prime time, it, it is so disheartening and yep. it's happening more and more, uh, than, than it, than it used to. And I mean, even in Jersey where I am right now, I was at a brewery not too long ago that's been open for about six months and they have major carbonation issues, major carbonation issues. And I, I mentioned it to the bartender. He's like, yeah, you know, we, we, we've been told like, we got to, you know, figure out like why it's happening that way. And then like, he like, you've been told, him, like, you should have done that a long time. And it's like, well, <laughs> Christ, like, you know, so it, it's things like that. So it's. I think like that. That's the that's the thing. There's a lot of fun behind opening up a brewery and a lot of excitement from uh, the manufacturers, but also the the community. Yeah. But like, I mean, for us, our taste room will be open two years in March. Um, and I still like. There's some days it feels one. like it's 20 years that we've been there. There's also days that like I can remember that opening weekend, and I can remember being face to face with consumers for the first time because we did contract brew and we did straight to distro. Yeah. It was drop you off at a store, move on to the next store. The only time we ever got to interact with consumers was at fests. And we mm-hmm. did a handful of fests because we didn't have enough beer to be at every fest. Yeah. Um, so for us to finally get that taste room open, seeing them come and experience microphone for the first time, me being able to talk to them in real time, get real time feedback on the beer was incredible, but also nerve wracking. Every time we released a new beer, I would just sit there and be like, oh my God, I hope they like it. I really hope they like it. I hope they like it. And then, you know, the, the, the face-to-face feedback would be helpful. And then we'd go on and tap and just make sure. Um, but it's, it was nerve wracking. And, we we always strive to make the best beer possible, and that's like going back to not sacrificing ingredients, um, not rushing beer. We let the beers kind of dictate the calendar, um, and you know, having to make those tough decisions. And you know, with us getting as creative as we are, we have had some instances where some beers went south on us. Some of these ingredients that we thought would work um, just didn't hold the test of time, or um, needed to be stored at a cold temperature. And if they weren't, it just they went south. So yeah. we took responsibility of that, and. and it took a while for us to understand or even know how to do that because um, we don't have – we have a lab, but we don't have a, a, a primetime lab like a Goose Island would. Um, so we couldn't have this – like when they had the Bourbon County issue, we didn't have that same access to figure that out. So yeah. it took us some time. We had to you know, get a lot of feedback from consumers because our test bottles were kind of in a controlled environment. And none of that was showing up for us. Sure. So this thing took you know, what consumers thought was you know, way too long. For us, we had to make sure that it was consistent and – Going then, and when we did, we did a huge announcement out there on you know, our social medias. Uh, obviously, told everyone in the tasting room, and we're still honoring those bottles. So, if you have a bottle, or if you had a bottle and it's on your credit card, we'll look it up and we'll make a refund because we know how important that is. We want people to know that we're trying to make the best beer possible, and if they have a bad experience, that could turn them away. So, we want to make sure that that bad experience turns into a good experience. Yeah, it's tough to come back from something like that. Yeah. So we were lucky that 
you know, the core of our audience understood that. Um, and the reality is it happens often. Yeah. Um, cause we are all trying new stuff and we don't have time to incubate a test batch. Um, but you know, we have to take responsibility for it. It's not their fault. They're spending harder money. They think, and they come to us for real reliability and consistency. And if something does go south, then that's on us, not them. Sure. So we had to own up to it. Do you have a hope for beer? I hope, and I think we talked about this last time and it still holds true is that I just hope it, it lasts. I hope people really continue to embrace this. Yeah. Um, it's become such a big part of communities. It's become a huge part of the neighborhoods, um, in Elk Grove, you know, we're the only brewery in Elk Grove and we've gotten the support from the mayor. We've gotten support from the board, um, local businesses. They all love it. And we do an annual festival year that all the money goes to a charity in the community. Um, and they have embraced it and at first they didn't, but now that they've seen what we can do and see the revenue and see the, the profits and charity, they love it. They absolutely love it. And you know, they, they treat it as their own and they, they want to look out for us. We look out for them and it's been great. So I hope, you know, if we do get to 7,000 or 8,000 or 10,000, whatever, um, I just hope that people continue to embrace it. And I really hope that, um, it just continues to be a part of our lives. Yeah. Um, and you know, you never know what tomorrow brings. And this is going to be a tough year for a lot of people. I think 2019, as we're seeing this rapid growth, you're going to see some of these breweries who expanded in the last two years, going from a seven barrel to a 30 barrel, mm -hmm. um, really having to make some tough decisions. Do we go outside of our market? Do we make this a national brand? Do we somehow downsize? Um, and you're starting to see a lot of closings. But I mean, a few years ago, yeah. opening a brewery was a hundred percent success rate. There was yeah. no closures. It was, sure. it was one of those things where it was an easy deal for an investor done. I'll do it. Nowadays, that's not the case. No. And you're seeing some, some big names go down. Um, and you're starting to see a push for people to go back to that, the core brands, right? Like you're seeing a lot of drink Sierra Nevada pale ale again, like yeah. get back to that. Yeah. Um, Which is wonderful. That beer's, like, that beer's a huge influence for most breweries, honestly, yes. that beer. And you even got beers like Miller high life and stuff like that, that still have a strong hold for us and fat tire, you know, those beers kind of, gave us excitement um, and gave us that, that idea that we could make beer. Um, a lot of us were homebrewing those recipes back in the day too. Yeah. Um, so I, like I said, I really hope that craft beer continues to be a, a part of our lives, um, continues to grow. Um, and then that there's a way that we can figure out to all kind of continuously commingle and work together and, you know, help each other in, in tough times. Yeah. Um, so we'll see where, we'll see what happens. But like I said, 19 is going to be an interesting year. Everything that I've been reading about, um, from the blogs to the podcast I listen to. Um, it's just, it's going to be one of those years that really make people make some tough decisions. Yeah. Hands down. It'll be curious to see what happens uh, at the end of it. Um, before we go, I want to say thanks to this episode's sponsors. G and D chillers is the brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling. The American homebrewers association is the organizer of the national homebrew competition and bring the world to your brew house with select ingredients from BSG. Thanks to all of them. And Mike Palin, thanks to you for sitting down again this Always time here in Colorado. Uh, <laughs> where can people find you? Um, so we are located in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago. Um, so if you fly into O'Hare Airport, yeah. look us up. We're, I think, one of the closest breweries to the airport at this point right now. Perfect. Um, we have a... 45 person occupancy tasting room right now, but we are in the process of getting the expansion done, which hopefully will be by March, I want to say. And 47 people. And that'll yeah. double us at least in tier to a hundred. Plus we'll have an outdoor patio finally as well. Cool. So that's good. Come, come and drink at the source. It's, we always have two new beers, if not three new beers a week. Um, you can buy bottles to go. You can drink on draft. Soon you'll be able to buy cans to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's super exciting. Uh, it's super exciting. The line then, forms to the right. Yeah, completely. And then, uh, yeah, you know, we, we use social media hard to kind of not just sell and promote. We actually don't try to sell and promote. We try to tell our story. Yeah. Um, this is still, I still talk in the first person day in and die, day out because this is something that, you know, I created in my basement with my wife and uh, it's still our story and our employees getting part of that and we allow them to to make beers and kind of showcase what they do so this is our story that we want to tell so follow us on facebook.com uh, slash microphone brewing instagram we don't use twitter but uh instagram and facebook are our big socials and then uh, we do have a website microphonebrewing.com um and see us out of fest we're we're gonna be everywhere you know, it's uh <laughs> coming it's soon a, to a city near yeah you. it's gonna be a crazy crazy uh 2019 for us on the road awesome 
Uh, well, uh, listeners, if you have questions for me, guests you'd like to hear, topics you'd like addressed, you can reach out to me at John Hall. It's J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L at beerandbrewing.com. Or, boy, the altitude is uh, is getting to me here in Breckenridge. I have to take more breaths than usual. Um, yep. Or join the conversation on Twitter at John underscore Hall. Uh, also go to beerandbrewing.com. There you can subscribe to the magazine. Please, please, please subscribe to the magazine where you'll be able to uh, read a story about Mike in an upcoming uh, issue, which I don't think I told you about, but I am going to write an article about you for an upcoming issue. Fantastic. And, uh, and more. Uh, homebrew recipes, what's happening in the craft beer scene, and insight from the world's best brewers right now are in our pages so uh, go to beerandbrewing.com uh, look at the content uh, sign up for our video classes and certainly subscribe to the magazine and we will be back next week with an all new episode so thanks so much for listening Mike thanks again cheers cheers this podcast is brought to you by craft beer and brewing magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.